if Ramsay has to school you about the basics in Hell's Kitchen of all places, now that's humiliating. Today, I'm going to be going over some of the most embarrassing things Hell's Kitchen has played host to in its day. And to get things started, here comes a contestant who absolutely burned half his team. No, not metaphorically. I'm talking real deal, physical burn. Oh boy, what have I gotten myself into? Sometimes, things can get really dangerous on Hell's Kitchen. Like this contestant's medical exit in season 8. I had a migraine. Good look at you here. But wait, was it a panic attack or did she fake it? Well, viewers think that she faked it because of the utter humiliation she faced during the performance with her signature dish. But what's your take on it? While you think about that, let me skip over to another time things got dicey in Hell's Kitchen. Don't worry, we'll be back on this topic before you know it. Christina took charge of the garnish station. As the team transitioned to entrees, a minor fire broke out in one of her pans. When the name itself is Hell's Kitchen, it's gonna get infernal. That much is a given, but that was a small one. Nothing major like this one. Out of the way, out of the way, out of the way, out, out of the way, out of the way. But the consequences were definitely major. When Ramsay called out for the salmon garnish, she brought her carrot puree to the pass punctually. However, a critical detail slipped through the cracks. She failed to mention that the handle of the pot was perched over an open flame. And guess what happened? Ramsay placed his hand on the handle because, well, that's where you put your hand, and the obvious happened. Yeah, anything's piping on. Ah, shit. Needless to say, he was fuming. No pun intended. Don't stop and look stupid like some thick cow. Fuck. After a quick trip to the sink to make sure his hand wasn't ruined for the rest of his life, Ramsey laid down the law. He instructed Christina to speak up if she ever noticed a handle hovering over the flame. The handle was over the flame. If the handle was over the stove, at least say something to somebody. Christina owned up to the mistake and pledged it would never happen again. <clears throat> This is foreshadowing. I just burned Chef Ramsay. That's really not cool. My mistake. Not gonna happen again. People, don't take the phrase never again seriously ever. If you know what's good for you. And well, I'm sure that's a lesson Ramsay learned real quick. Considering it came around the hard way. And with no other way to get it through Christina's skull, Ramsay poured water over the sizzling handle to emphasize the scorching reality of the situation. No, no. You're, not even, you're, not, you're not even telling me. Once again, he stressed to Christina the importance of speaking up if a handle ever found its way over the flame. This episode had viewers seriously questioning how Christina won despite such astronomical levels of negligence. Thankfully though, she learned her lesson. Since this was about the biggest screw up she's ever had on the show, or well, anything that's come after. All downhill from here, I guess. Speaking of, remember this from season 14? Now, this is when Michael found himself at the garnish station. However, he started screwing up in record time, and both Ramsay and sous chef James took notice, and Millie got stuck with having to pick up the slack on the flatbreads. Ramsay swiftly called him out for how scatterbrained he was. After all, being attuned to the entire kitchen's needs should take precedence over having his station be perfectly spick and span. A little bit of mess is fine. So we haven't sent the advertise yet, you're so keen about getting your stuff ready. How about looking overall? And then, bringing up the topic of hot pans again, he dropped a real scorcher of one on a rack. And I'm sure Ramsey was flashing back real hard to what happened 10 seasons ago with Christina. Uh, Michael, what the f are you doing? Concerned for the safety of his fellow chefs, Ramsey didn't mince words in lecturing Michael about the potential serious burns that could occur if someone, like, I don't know, Brett or Josh, grabbed that pan not knowing how hot it was. They're talking, they go down and grab a pan of scorpion cells. Yeah. So why would you put that? What are you doing? Oh, yeah, playing with fire, literally. Thankfully, Ramsey spotted the potential disaster before it unfolded. Or, well, he burned his hand again. The pan's about to burst into flames. What'd you do? Sorry, Chef. Come on. Oh, and in the same service, Adam left a piece of plastic in a customer's scallop salad. As if things weren't already going so poorly. That was in the scallop salad. Come on, fellas. 
Who dressed it? I did, Chef. Anyway, for Michael, what's worse is that he wasn't exactly remorseful about the whole near catastrophe. Nope, not even a hint of my bad or I messed up. Instead, he rolled with it like everyone else was overreacting. As the night wore on, another misstep occurred when Michael, against Nick's advice, prematurely sent out his garnishes. We'll talk about the drama that unfolded there another time. But what happened here was equally, if not more dangerous. Stick with me. The repercussions were swift and collective, with both teams earning the unfortunate designation of joint losers for the evening. During his plea to stay, Michael boldly asserted that he possessed the skills and experience necessary to be Ramsey's next head chef, despite a rocky start. That's putting it mildly. I feel that I, uh, I had a rough start, chef. You didn't f***ing stop. In the end, Michael's journey in Hell's Kitchen came to an end. Ramsey pointed out that, in addition to his lackluster performances, leaving a scorching hot pan beneath the fish station was a potentially dangerous oversight that could have seriously injured his teammates. Or him. He didn't say that, but he meant it. They're cooking blind. The hand goes down. As a third degree burn. Post elimination, he shared his belief that Nick and Adam were the real liabilities of the blue team. I think Nick and Adam are liabilities. You know, serving raw pork, serving plastic in a salad. Like I said, he didn't regret it at all. Like the lack of self awareness? I don't even know what to say. Now, coming to season five, Robert had an unexpected encounter with a, you guessed it, hot pan in the fridge, resulting in an accidental burn on his hand. Frustration set in when he discovered that Giovanni hadn't informed anyone about the hot pan in the fridge, which led to the unfortunate incident. As it turned out, Robert had sustained a second degree burn. Giovanni put a 500 degree hand in the cooler, didn't tell anybody. But Ramsey took Giovanni to task over it. Despite Giovanni's evident remorse for accidentally causing harm to his fellow teammate, Ramsey didn't hold back in chewing him out over it. Are you? Why was it a piping hot tray in a stone cold fridge? Giovanni approached Robert to offer an apology after he got back from getting some much needed medical attention. However, Robert chose to ignore Gio, and I can't say I blame him. Robert, I'm sorry, man. I mean, anything more would be a huge show of grace from Robert. And when it's your hand on the line, I mean, it seems pretty fair. Now, this reminds me of season six, when Sabrina ended up being a colossal disaster every time she was put on meat. And Chef Ramsey says, you know what, stop cooking and just send out cold stuff. That's embarrassing. About an hour and a half into the second service, she confidently declared that her chicken was ready to roll. There was just uh, one minor detail. It was still raw. So back into the pan it went for another round of cooking. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's not. We gotta put it back in. But wait, it gets better. Just a minute later, she said screw it and sent her chicken to the pass anyway. Suzanne tried to warn her, but Sabrina wasn't having it. Suzanne, it's my station. I got it. It's your I put it in the trash can. I know it's wrong. Like, what do I even say here? Look, shut up. <laughs> Shut up for one minute. As if that wasn't enough, Ramsey returned to find Sabrina's chicken both crispy and burnt. That was the tipping point. The chicken is pinker than your f lipstick. So Ramsey decided that both teams needed a little breather and ordered them to send out shrimp cocktails to the dining room. Then in the sixth dinner service, Sabrina found herself at the meat station again. When Ramsey asked about the, you guessed it, chicken, she confidently stated that she had already sent it up. The catch, it was nowhere to be found. Not at the hot plate, not at a table. Man, what is it with this woman and chicken? Okay, we're not here then, will somebody help me then? No, what do you think, we're lying? Where's the chicken gone? And to keep the chicken catastrophes rolling, Sabrina then needed assistance carving it. Suzanne offered some quick directions, but the 30 second job turned into a huge ordeal real quick. Like this? Yep, uh, go in. No, way. Th that way. Yep. Bring me out the fing chicken! Unfortunately, the result was about as bad as you're probably imagining. But was it Sabrina's fault? Nah, it was Suzanne's. I'm serious. Suzanne, Miss Pris, tell me things anymore. She wasn't gonna let anyone help her, but also didn't know which knife to use. Wow, the troubles didn't end there. Some raw pork made its way back to the hot plate. That's raw pork. That's pretty good. Chef, 
Let's run this into. Oh no. As if that wasn't enough, some raw lamb came back too. And Sabrina's defense was that it was medium well when she sent it out. But like, did the customers manage to uncook it somehow? Well, that's what Sabrina thought. What? Medium well was a request. They were medium well. That is not medium well. Shit hit the fan in the eighth service, and well, it was serious this time. Let me organize another one and apologize. Oh. No. Although Sabrina managed to send out her lamb to the dining room, it landed on a table in a state that could only be described as, uh, how would Ramsey put it? Bloody and rare. Bloody rare? I don't know, you tell me. Anyway, Jean-Philippe brought it back, and Ramsey was so fed up with her sabotage at this point that he ordered her to face the consequences by heading out to the dining room, personally experiencing the repercussions of her mistake. Sabrina did what she knew best and pointed the finger at Suzanne. I wasn't ready. I said, we can't go. And Suzanne forced me to go. Susie me. Later that night, Ramsey summoned Sabrina back into the kitchen. After a stern lecture about the gravity of sending raw meat to customers, something that should have been a given, he granted her a chance at redemption by allowing her back to the cooking line. So the simple message, madam. Yes, chef. If you're not going to eat it, do you actually think I'm going to send it? But like, she should have been kicked out, right? She was given like 50 chances in that episode alone. I don't know, am I the crazy one here? Anyway, in season 15's 12th dinner service, Frank was a Signed to the fish station. And surprise, surprise, he screwed the pooch too. But did he own up to it? Nope. Early on, he picked a fight with Danny over communication skills. But things started getting dicey. Frank Snappers turned out raw. He blamed Manda for it. But Ramsey really didn't want to engage and prompted Frank to pick up the pace instead. Speed up, let's go. Raw fish. How thick is the fish? Frank had Jared watch over the snapper, which eventually got approved. However, the success was short-lived. Oh, bueno. In the back. Really? Later, Jared advised Frank not to compromise Manda's timing by sending his fish before her garnishes. Manda confronted Frank about it when he laughed off the criticism. To me, he was one of the worst chefs Hell's Kitchen has ever seen. And you'd be surprised to know what happened to him. Watch this video here if you're curious. Now, onto the third service of season 14. Lots went down. Randy cut himself so, so badly. Medic, medic, medic in the kitchen. Bad? It went to the bone. Right. Uh -oh. Then, tripped. And, and that wasn't the end of it. There was also Nick. He teamed up with Brendan at the meat station, but the two of them apparently couldn't put their heads together and managed to send out an ounce of raw pork. Look, look, it's raw. Brett was right. But Nick wasn't so sure. The way it was, that's just me. Three minutes to the window, okay? Eating raw pork, my man, why would you do that? Look at this comment, for example. Raw pork is no joke. Family friend ate raw pork overseas and ended up with brain tapeworm. She's been living with it for decades. Scary stuff. Um, scary stuff is putting it a little mildly, my guy. But Mr. Confidence over here was far from done. He was really insistent on getting everybody on his raw pork diet. It's raw. But Nick wasn't a fan of undercooked lamb. Really? That's where you draw the line? Anyway, he asked for an extra minute on it. Despite this, Michael sent up his garnishes early. Caught between Ramsey's anger over raw food and the prospect of a long wait, Nick reluctantly directed Brendan to send out the raw lamb. Which went about as well as you'd expect. It's full of blood. All of you, come here. Who donkeyed that? Now, I used to wonder why Ramsey consistently tries to get his chefs to speed up, only to see dishes returning due to incomplete cooking. Is the yelling just for show? It's clear Ramsey gets visibly pissed when food is sent back, so why not let the chefs take the necessary time they need to cook it? Surely drama can't be more important than a smoothly executed service. I think I just answered my own question there. Jokes aside, I've since realized that some urgency might be a result of crafty editing. Ramsey, being an experienced chef, has gotta recognize the actual time required for dishes. When Ramsey throws out seemingly exaggerated time demands, like wanting a dish in six minutes instead of eight, it makes you wonder. He can clearly spot a bogus time estimate a mile away. Hey, 
your timing and midnight will still be sending in main courses. Yes, chef. But when faced with an unrealistically short estimate, say 40 seconds for a lobster tail, Ramsey challenges the chef to prove it. He stands there, watch in hand, ready to count down. Remember Joy? When a chef asks for an extra minute, Ramsey questions if there's a legit reason behind it. Did someone forget to get the meat in the oven on time? Or maybe the kitchen was juggling too many tickets at once? The idea is simple. If everyone followed the playbook, those extra minutes wouldn't be necessary. Now, in the same season, during prep before the 14th service, Michelle hastily left to use the bathroom, unknowingly placing a pot onto a hot element. You run to the restroom. Fast. Megan quickly found the smoking pot, which eventually burst into flames. Help, help. Oh my god. Help. Oh. Ha! You thought I was done with the hot pan content. Uh, oh, okay, okay, I'm done for real now. Let's cut to season 10 during the dome challenge. Royce selected lobster for his dish and after tasting it, expressed confidence in its exceptional flavor. As the final contestant faced judgment from the blue team, he presented a poached lobster infused with saffron and thyme. However, his moment in the sun crashed and burned when Douglas Keane pulled a long, long hair out of the dish. What was that? Hair. Uh... But Royce played ignorant. That's gross. It's not curly, so I'm pretty happy about that. As if that wasn't enough, Michael Chimarusti revealed that the lobster hadn't been deveined yet. Dude may as well have taken a dump on the plate personally. The shit sack. That's a bad dish I have. Now, as I binge watch season after season, one thought keeps nagging at me. Where in the world are the hairnets? Long locks of hair twirling around during service. That means you, Melissa Furpo. And don't get me started on the scraggly beard some of the guys are flaunting. Sure, Millie's got his beard all braided up during service, and Adam from season 19 had some mysterious beard management technique going on. But when we're talking about food safety, this stuff matters. Like, imagine getting this served to you. I'm a hair in my food. They contain a little something extra. But the worst part is that hair is really good at pulling in all sorts of nasty stuff like dirt and bacteria from around it. So why the heck aren't hairnets mandatory in these kitchens? Anyway, regarding Royce, there were two other things that concerned me. In the scallop challenge, his face was bleeding because Guy allegedly slapped him with a scallop. Guy just hit me in the face with a scallop. Boom. Guy's justification was that Royce had it coming for attempting to throw him under the bus the night before. But like, is this guy hearing himself? Trevor, can you stop your head back? Go, go, go. I think the Royce deserved it. Then, during the infamous fashion night service, Ramsey caught Royce in the act of cleaning plates with a dirty cloth. Despite Ramsey providing a clean cloth as an alternative and temporarily placing Royce at the chef's table. With that, how the cloth? Hey, come here. Apart from this, Ramsey discovered 11 wasted swordfish portions. Take a wild guess who was behind that. Come here, you. What the f have you done? Ramsey learned that he instructed Clemenza to prepare 16 plus 1 swordfish. However, a visibly agitated Clemenza insisted that he communicated 17 everything all day. But we don't need all these! I was told 18, chef. In response to the apparent miscommunication, Ramsey directed both men to trash the swordfish altogether. You hold it up, you put them in. Speaking of Joe Bastianich's partner in crime, let's not forget this one incident from season 9. During the second dinner service, Brendan's performance on the fish station was nothing short of revolting. His initial blunder involved firing Seabass for a table without coordinating with the rest of the team. Pretty normal so far, right? After being urged to improve communication, Brendan was then instructed to drop another Seabass. You ready to go Let's on call entrees? It out now. Brendan, I'm, yes, I'm called it. Who called the entrees? However, suspicion arose when Brendan presented his second attempt, with Ramsey questioning if he had sent the Seabass cooked 10 minutes prior. Brendan denied the accusation outright. Yeah. You didn't start a fresh one? Yes, I did, chef. So where's the old one then? But Ramsey wanted the receipts. So Brendan delved into the garbage bin in search of the supposedly disposed sea bass. Surprise, surprise, he returned empty handed. Chef, I can't find it. Are you lying to me? Because right? I'm, I'm going to stop this.
The shock of the century, I tell ya. When pressed, Brendan finally admitted to the lie, revealing that the sea bass was, indeed, old. Take a moment and guess how hard Ramsay flipped out. Go on, I'll give you a sec. Yeah, he had an automatic elimination coming his way should he choose to lie again. But while he got his act together as far as truth was concerned, his actual execution wasn't so lucky. When presenting his sea bass, it turned out to be just so incredibly raw. Ramsey was unimpressed with the men's inability to serve a single entree. So the guys getting kicked out of the kitchen was inevitable. Not one entree has left together yet. Not, Not sending fresh food like Brendan over here is dangerous. But what's more lethal is lying to Ramsey's face. And now, time for the third service from season three. If you're an HK Mega fan, you know what's coming. So, Jen pulled a bunch of cooked spaghetti from the trash, intending to use it for the next ticket. Away next. Scala risotto spaghetti, yes? However, and thankfully, Julia intervened convincing Jen not to serve it as it was entirely unacceptable. The very thought of a chef resorting to serving food from the trash was incomprehensible up until this moment. The fact that it almost happened, criminal. From the top of the garbage and washed it to 12. That had to have been the easiest instant elimination of Ramsey's life. If he found out about it sooner anyway. While chefs like Guarov might catch some flack for their whole finger-tasting thing, let's be real, that's nothing. At least, compared to the crime of hauling food out of the trash and thinking it's okay to serve. <sighs> Hell's Kitchen is rarely boring, but not every second of the show can live in your head rent-free forever. But here's a rundown of a few moments that you and I are likely to never forget. And there's no way I could make a list like this without mentioning Jen Yamola. So in episode 3 of season 3, during the dinner service, Ramsay switched her and Julia to the appetizer station post Joanna's rancid crab fiasco, expecting things would go well. But oh boy was he wrong. The women got busy preparing spaghetti and that's when Jen here did something so unexpected that it became a highlight of the entire episode. Certainly the season and maybe the entire show, period. Julia, what you got in here is enough for two orders, okay? Okay. I'm gonna toss this other one. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what's the big deal if she just tossed out a bunch of extra spaghetti? But here's the thing. Seconds later, Julia suddenly needed all that spaghetti. And what did Jen decide to do? When I decided to retrieve the spaghetti from the top of the garbage and I decided to serve it. Look, I get it. Jen was in total panic mode. But grabbing the pasta back out of the trash? That move was straight up nasty. I mean, seriously. No matter how thoroughly she washed it, it would just never sit right to anyone who knew where it came from. You just can't think of serving that to anyone. And that's not even going into the potential health risks. Pretty hard to fathom, right? But here's the thing. When Julia asked where she got the spaghetti from, Jen had no trouble talking about it. Where'd you get it from? Garbage on top. No, 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 no. No way. Gotta say, it's kinda shocking how shamelessly she was willing to admit it. However, Julia was stumped. I mean, come on. Who in their right mind would be cool with something like that? Who in the world picks food out of the trash? You can't just do anything in the heat of the moment. It really makes you think how much she cares about hygiene. I mean, these aren't the kind of standards you should expect from a professional pastry chef, right? And if it wasn't for Julia's timely intervention, Jen would have totally served that spaghetti. And I've gotta say, Jen should be really thankful that Julia kept her dirty little secret, uh, well, secret. Had Ramsey seen what she had done, he would have eliminated her right on the spot, no doubt. But this nasty little surprise is hardly the craziest thing I've got in store for you today. You see, things got really heated during season six, episode six's dinner service. And I'm not even joking. So here's what happened. Tennille was at the garnish station at one point, and she made more spinach than what was needed, which obviously didn't sit well with Ramsey. What's all this spinach for? Why is all this spinach cooked like this? You've got 12 portions in there. Not hard to understand that she did this to reduce the workload by half later on down the line, but that's not how a fine dining restaurant's kitchen is supposed to function. 
freshness and quality are really important. And Ramsey wasn't having any of it. This kind of behavior in his kitchen was unacceptable. Well, wake up! Yes, chef. Wake up! You'll just finish the order, you lazy cow! Ramsey's statement clearly threw Tennille off guard. She believed Ramsey owed her some respect because she was working her ass off like everyone else. But that's just the bare minimum to scrape by in Ramsey's kitchen. He's well known for being tough, and this goes for all contestants on the show. It wasn't like he was targeting her alone, but that didn't stop him from making his frustration known. Stewed spinach, rabbit food, f you. Well, that's classic Ramsey for ya. But you won't believe what Tennille had to say. She's a disrespectful British motherfucker. <laughs> Things only got worse from there, because when she served the mashed potatoes, nothing could prepare her for Ramsey's reaction. Tennille, that's my two portions of mash, look at that. Just that, that's the way I get treated. Ramsey couldn't believe his eyes. There was barely enough for a two portion meal, and yet Tennille had the audacity to complain that Ramsey was picking on her over nothing. Things took a turn for the worse when Ramsey's insults didn't seem to stop, and Tennille's own frustration started to show too. You gotta take something up to the past, it's too much. Take something else, it's not enough. You just gotta find something to bitch about. Ramsey didn't take this disrespect lightly, and so he did the only logical thing he could think of. He kicked her out of the kitchen, but Tennille didn't go quietly. Get the f out of here. F you. F you. The audacity at this point was unbelievable. She clearly messed up, but instead of owning up to her mistakes, she was going in with that attitude. And Ramsey wasn't one to back down either. He decided to go right after her. Now, it's easy to lose your cool in a place as emotionally charged as Hell's Kitchen, but you can't forget who's in charge. And Ramsey was determined to put her in her place. He straight up told her not to diss him or she would be walking home in seconds flat. However, Tennille was so pissed that she kept yelling back at him. Ramsey finally had enough and gave her a stern warning. Either get out or get back in the kitchen. And of course, Tennille chose the latter. She wasn't ready to give up yet. And so, putting her ego aside for the greater good, she decided to return to her station. Well, if that isn't the most sensible thing she's done all day. But what happened with this next contestant was even wilder. In the second episode of season one, three hours into the dinner service, the tension started to escalate. Yeah, things weren't any more lackadaisical back in the day. Tables had started clearing out as a result of Dewberry's meltdown in the reg kitchen, bringing the entire kitchen to a standstill. Customers were understandably displeased, and one couple took it upon themselves to lodge a complaint directly with Ramsey. However, Ramsey didn't take too kindly to it. So, why don't you fuck off? Asparagus, please. Ramsey's response might come off as harsh, but seriously, who walks straight into the kitchen to drop a complaint? If you've got an issue, take it up with the manager or a waiter like a civilized person. However, the couple, fuming about their delayed food, headed back to their table where the rest of the crew was just as upset. But what they were about to do next transcended the boundaries of mere disrespect. They were about to really twist the knife. And some customers have taken matters into their own hands. So get this, this bunch of diners actually went ahead and ordered pizza for themselves. I mean, the audacity to order from a fast food joint while being lucky enough to have a seat in a fine dining restaurant was unbelievable. It was almost like they were itching for a fight with Ramsey. However, JP, being the chill dude that he is, decided to intervene. He hurried over to their table, trying to drop some knowledge about proper etiquette. But you won't believe what the customer did. They straight up shut him down, and this time, JP wasn't ready to back down. Uh, did you bring us our entree? Let me ask you. No, you did not. I wish your education could be as good as your, as your voice. Who knew JP could deliver a burn like that? But the customer wasn't having any of it. He decided to put up a fight of his own. I have a doctorate in music from the University of Southern California. Yes, do you have a doctorate? I do have an education. Boasting about your doctorate wasn't the right move here, buddy. If anything, it just made the situation a whole lot worse. And this guy here not only tried to flex his doctorate, but also insulted JP in the same breath. Then you are less educated would, than me, so I don't would, get in my face, buddy, hey, hey, about what kind not, of education. Right now, right now, right now. This customer 
was downright disrespectful, disregarding JP's worth based on his educational background. If anything, from what we just witnessed, it's clear that his degree didn't hold any value. Or at least it didn't teach him how to be a decent human being. It's pretty low to throw shade at someone just because they don't have a super special piece of paper like you do, dude. The upside is that the confrontation didn't spiral into something worse. Thankfully, someone stepped in before things got seriously ugly. Or before Ramsey got word of it. If he had, I don't think he would have calmed down from it even to this day. But hey. This wasn't the only case when a customer left their manners at home. Episode 9 of Season 5 sure was a rough one for Ben. During the dinner service, he was at the appetizer station. He was working on the bisque, but things didn't exactly go to plan. Quick, quick dig in there, yeah? Quick dig in there. Make sure to take a nice big mouthful. Big mouthful. Mm. <sighs> it came out real salty. And Ramsey forced all his fellow contestants to taste it, just so they knew how badly Ben had screwed up. While Robert claimed it was disgusting, Ramsey was appalled about how he screwed up on something as simple as reheating soup. Salty yes. soup. Yes, he yes. was reheating it. Yes. So how can you fuck it? It was bland before it overreduced. It's my fault. I should have tasted it, chef. You're clumsy. Yes, you chef. salted it. Finally, Ben admitted he overreduced the bisque and added more salt to compensate for it. Which, if you know anything about cooking, that logic is kind of backwards. But Ramsey wasn't buying his excuse. He accused Ben of being clumsy despite his desperate attempt to prove his worth. However, Ben just couldn't redeem himself. Oh my god, look at him. Look at him. With Ben's mistake slowing the entire blue kitchen down, some of their customers were forced to watch the red diners dive into their appetizers at the same table. And this one customer in particular had no chill. It's the same goddamn thing. You played it the same thing. Oh gosh, I am so going back. Now, this customer had raised an issue earlier when she thought the food she received was bland. Turns out the refire wasn't any better. The customer was so disappointed that she decided to walk herself to the hot plate, confront Ramsey, and lay out all her issues loud and clear. Totally flat, no flavor. Okay, thank you. Now, Ramsey was trying to keep this dumpster fire of a service on track, and yet he took the time to listen to the complaints, even though it wasn't his job. What's more, he also responded to her concerns rather politely, which, let me remind you, is a very rare occurrence in and of itself. But this lady wasn't having any of it. When Ramsey started to walk away from her, she came up with a disgraceful way to try and gain his attention. Jeff! Right. Don't whistle at me, I'm not your f***ing dog. Well, you've definitely got it now. But it came with the unfortunate side effect of pissing Ramsey the hell off. He was straight up brutal, as he should have been. Yeah, you look more like a dog than I do. Savage. I mean, he totally chewed her out. You could see the disappointment and, gotta say, embarrassment all over her face. It was hands down one of the most satisfying moments in Hell's Kitchen history. But hey, let's take a break from the drama. As much as I love a good fight, whether physical or verbal, there are some seriously heart-wrenching moments in Hell's Kitchen too. Remember Petroza from season four? Of course you do. The dude had a heart of gold and his character shone through in episode 5 during the dinner service, when Lou Ross was having a hard time with his steak. His first attempt was a total fail, and his second wasn't much better. You f***ed it up, you didn't cook it right, and you're trying to get it by me. Do you have another one that I can see a nice pink center in? Yes, chef. Lou Ross was clearly having a hard time, so guess who came to the rescue? This is our chance. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. Well, well, this is the only shot that we got. That's right, Petroza himself. And what did he do? We had to show the face of the beef. So I had to slice a sliver off it. I wanna get the fucking food out. So Petroza daringly decided to rescue the situation by cutting off the burnt edges of the beef. Although Lou Ross wasn't really sold on the plan, Petroza took the risk anyway. And you won't believe it. It actually worked. Petroza tricked sous chef Scott, saved the steaks, and left Lou Ross in total shock and relief. This guy was the type to never hesitate in lending a hand, even if it meant putting his own neck on the line. 
What's more, Petroza was such a pure soul that he did it without being asked. But what happened in episode 7 during the elimination round was the most heartwarming moment of the entire show. When Bobby gave him a vote and Ramsey asked him to pick someone, Petroza threw a total curveball. I'm gonna nominate myself, chef. I'm pretty sure no one expected that, not even Ramsey himself. But it was his reason that was truly heartwarming. I can't pick any of these guys. They worked too hard and we came in today and worked our asses off. You know, I tried to get the job done. I just, I wasn't a star in that spot today. He declared he couldn't pick any of his teammates since all of them had equally busted their asses. This guy was so pure of heart that he'd rather eliminate himself than anyone else. Ramsey praised his outstanding level of maturity and declared that he was the most gracious man on the blue team. Petroza successfully managed to survive, too. But things were about to get even more emotional. I already feel like a winner. I already feel like a winner. Petroza got all teary-eyed while pouring his heart out to Ramsey. He claimed that he already felt like a winner, even though he knew that there was a crazy road ahead. I mean, how many times do you see someone nominating themselves when they were one of the front runners? Not a lot, and they certainly don't survive to tell the tale if they do. But here comes an episode that was just plain fun. So what happened is, during the signature dish challenge of season 7, when the contestants were lined up to present their dishes, Ramsey noticed that most of them had vast culinary experience. However, one of them stuck out like a sore thumb. There was one that I seem to remember you with the glasses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. What'd you do for a living? I'm a mom, um, but I'm a cookbook author. Apparently, this person was a stay-at-home mom, and not exactly the textbook definition of a chef de la cuisine. And when it was time for her to present her dish, Ramsey called her down, and the contestant presented her veal scallopini with spinach. Apart from it looking like baby vomit, what is that? It's a uh, veal scallopini. Going by the looks of it, Ramsey wasn't a huge fan. In fact, he said that it looked like baby vomit, but after tasting it, his opinion changed for the better. Listen to me. That dish was delicious. Thank you, chef. I mean, I'm shocked. It may look slightly dull and boring, a little bit like you, but well done. <laughs> Ramsey was floored. He even commented that it looked boring, like the contestant herself, but taste-wise, it was pretty good. And this is where things were about to get real juicy. While the contestant was ideally supposed to head back into the line, Ramsey decided to cut in and reward her. And you won't believe what he did. Okay, let me give you a hug. Up there, right, relax. Relax, relax, relax. Like what? That had to be a first. And I wasn't the only one to notice. But a few moments later, things got even weirder. What a great start. If that's a sign of things to come, well done. Thank you. Man. Did Ramsey just plant a kiss on the contestant's cheek? But nobody was ready for what happened next. What the hell just happened? And it wasn't just about a peck. These two were completely engrossed in their own little world, oblivious to the prying eyes of the onlooking spectators. <laughs> Trust me. The whole incident was about to be super scandalous. I mean, let's not forget this was all going down in an episode which would soon be aired on national television. But before anyone could make any more assumptions, Ramsey decided to make the big reveal. This person is... Oh, um, My wife, Tana. No way. Total shocker, right? Turns out, Ramsey and his wife Tana were playing a bit of a prank on the contestants. I mean, for a whole minute or so, I'm sure each of these contestants' jaws were practically hitting the floor. This little prank of theirs came with a valuable lesson. Ramsey explained that experience didn't matter. All he wanted to see was the magic. And with that, season seven was off to a glorious start. I didn't set it up, Chef. So Who I set it up. And they set it up. She can't cook asparagus. She snores and it keeps us all awake. These are the contestants who straight up betrayed their teammates. And how about starting things off with this contestant from the All Stars season? 
So, it was the Italian night dinner service. Michelle was assigned to the meat station, while Manda was in charge of preparing the pasta dishes. For those of you who didn't know, Manda has celiac disease, so she couldn't taste the pasta herself. And so, she went for the next best thing and asked Michelle for her opinion instead. Michelle tasted Manda's pasta and nodded in approval, saying it was good. Taste that for me. Is that done? Mmm. 30 more seconds, okay. So far, so normal, right? However, unknown to Manda, Michelle had ulterior motives. Ramsey tasted it and, well, what do you know? The first batch of pasta returned to the kitchen undercooked. It looks like a lot, chef. It's a no, just is taste raw. it. Just taste it. Is raw. It's crunchy as Manda was puzzled because she trusted Michelle's judgment. Michelle, on the other hand... I can tell when pasta's done just by looking at it, so Manda should be able to do it too. So were you blind while checking Manda's dish? Or, uh, what do you call not being able to taste? Anyway, Manda made a second attempt in hopes of getting it right this time. But as if she learned absolutely nothing, she sought Michelle's opinion again. Michelle, in turn, claimed the pasta was fine. Again. I need a mouth. Here, Michelle. It's done. Michelle says the is done. But thanks to Elise, it was revealed that the pasta was still raw. And you wouldn't believe how nonchalant Michelle was about the whole thing. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. My bad. The first time I could excuse as an honest mistake. But twice? Nah, I don't think so. And she was so unapologetic about it. Michelle was fooling no one. Viewers saw right through it, and Manda also realized that she was being misled. Good job. Me twice now. Well, at least she didn't go in for a third round of punishment. But this next contestant exposed herself for the conniving, self-absorbed prick that she was during her run on the show. Witnessing Heather's struggle on the appetizer station in the third service brought a wicked gleam to Sarah's eye. Some kind of perverse, sadistic pleasure. She didn't just observe, she took pleasure in Heather's challenges, making a snide comment about the risotto too. I couldn't have graduated culinary school without making risotto. It's not my first rodeo. <laughs> in the fourth service, she was even more conniving. Tasked with the fish station, she forewent all pretenses of teamwork. Uh, Sarah, are we ready, yes? Yeah, I was waiting for her call, Steph. Called it three times. Her lack of communication with Rachel, despite repeated calls, disrupted the whole kitchen's flow. Yet, the extent of her deceit went beyond that. When Virginia asked if she was set with her turbot, Sarah brazenly lied, claiming she was. How close are you to the turbot and the tortellini? How I'm ready and waiting for your call. Can we start reading these plates up? Trusting her word, Virginia sent her Wellingtons to the pass, only to discover Sarah hadn't even begun cooking the turbot yet. And Ramsay wasn't pleased with either of them. Where's the turbot? Chef, I haven't fired it yet. In the aftermath, Sarah's reaction was chillingly remorseless. She seemed pretty pleased that her underhanded plan went, well, according to plan. She did start cooking it, Chef. So now you want to start lying to me. I'm not lying to you, Chef. She laughed silently as Virginia faced Ramsey's wrath for what he saw as sabotage. Sarah didn't speak up and say, Chef, I did tell her that I was ready. She should have at least spoken up and said something. Damn right she should have. In a word, it just really sucked to see Sarah put Virginia through that. Did I misunderstand you when I heard you say you were ready whenever I am? Uh, it was tortellini. I didn't but here comes one of the most unworthy winners of HK, Ariel Malone of season 15. And her betrayal during the second service was deviously underhanded. Two snapper, three chicken, I'm dying. That's gonna be five to the window shut. What's wrong with the snapper? While Mia stepped away for a moment, Ariel pounced on the opportunity, snatching her snapper and serving it up raw. We never said it was ready. Ariel came and grabbed it and took it up there. Oh my god, seriously. But when it came time to own up to it, Ariel conveniently sidestepped responsibility, refusing to admit to her blatant sabotage. Who cooked the snapper? Ariel comes said, oh, chef, my bad, I brought it up. But no. She stood there, letting Meese take the fall. God, talk about spinelessness. Fortunately, it earned her some rightful ire from Meese and Danny. You don't touch somebody else's dish.
Then came the elimination nomination following the third service loss. Who is now finally up for elimination? Mies and, and um, Amanda. Did I hear that right? Mies and Amanda. But instead of sticking to the team's consensus, Ariel kept plotting behind everyone's back. She backstabbed Vanessa by scheming to get her eliminated while pretending to follow the team's agreed upon plan. Chef, our second nominee is Vanessa. At dismissal, Ariel shamelessly defended her underhanded tactics, citing Ramsey's supposed question about the team's weakest links. But let's call a spade a spade. Ariel's move was a manipulative, self-serving ploy that completely shattered the team's internal trust. Sure, the team had struggling members, but Ariel's actions reeked of disloyalty and cowardice. It wasn't just about the elimination, it was about trust and integrity which Ariel threw completely out the window. <sighs> now, that reminds me. Mia from season 18 is largely considered a fan favorite, but despite her popularity, there's this one moment I just can't let slide. And it went down during Tilly's sweet 16th birthday service. Happy birthday, Tilly! Chef the chef, let's go, duty. Tasked with the fish station alongside Ariel, her errors were not just glaring, but downright embarrassing. Can you get a bit more batter on the fish, please? More, more, more batter? batter on the fish, make more it thicker. Batter. Yes, Chef. Sous Chef Jockey rejected her fish for not being battered enough. But the real catastrophe came with her refire. It emerged from the kitchen raw. It's, you touch it! It's ice cold, Chef. It's ice cold! And Ramsay was beyond angry. Wait for it. Give me the head and the tail, I'll put it back in the water. Mia. There it is, right on point. Eventually, their team ended up losing the service. Mia found herself in a hot seat of her own making. But instead of taking responsibility for her abysmal performance, she tried to deflect blame by pointing the finger at Kane, citing problems with the ahi tuna earlier in the service. Your tartare was getting sent back because it wasn't sliced, wasn't sliced properly. properly. Yeah. Yeah. Mia's downfall wasn't just about her poor performance, it was about deception and betrayal. Still, that didn't stop her from trying to squirm her way out of accountability. When I came to my station, I didn't have batter done. I didn't set it up, Chef, so Who I- set it up? Kane set it up. When Ramsey questioned her capability, Mia tried throwing Kane under the bus again claiming that Kanae's prep failure led to her struggles during service. However, Kanae, backed up by Ariel, Regardless of who's set up, all stations were set up on time, so let's she stop talking about that. Game right now. Made it clear that the batter was prepared as needed during prep, exposing Mia's attempt at deflecting blame as nothing but a lie to save face. I, I started making the batter as soon as we got into the kitchen. She's trying to play the blame game. Damn right she was. But that wasn't the end of Mia's deceit. When questioned why she believed she deserved to stay over Roe, she claimed to have communicated with her team and taken responsibility for her actions. I was communicating the whole night. I do take ownership of my station. I'm a team player and I'm a leader too. However, her actions on the line and her attempts to blame others indicated quite the opposite. Like, I get it's a competition, but geez, have a little bit of decency. Now, let's talk about Baby Spice. Hey, Baby Spice, as long as you're okay, right? No, chef. Here's my food, everybody else. Well, on the meat station, Sabrina showed her true colors in the very first service, when she decided to go against her team's strategy. When Ramsey cautioned her to wait for Lisa's scallops before starting her Wellingtons, Sabrina forged ahead without paying that bit of advice any attention whatsoever. Sabrina, hold up on that. We need the salmon and the tagline telling first before anything else. Dude, I can't wait! Ignoring even more advice from Gail, she was hell-bent on sending out her Wellingtons early. I just spent like 20 minutes cooking all this, letting it rest, doing it right, you know? As if that was gonna go well. Why are you throwing them under the bus? I'm not, Chef. What can I do with it? Nothing, Chef. Oh, I think she totally deserved being up for elimination that night. You are, quite frankly, the most selfish cook in here. Ramsey's justified criticism didn't phase Sabrina. Instead, she stubbornly defended herself during the plea, indirectly pointing the finger at Lisa's age. She's spent, chef. You know, I'm young. The world is my what oyster. Was that? I'm Just spent. Me. 
Uh huh, that's definitely the problem here. Instead of reflecting on her own actions, she took yet another low blow at Nona, attempting to discredit her with even more petty and irrelevant excuses. Her idea of fine dining is fried chicken chef. She can't cook asparagus, she snores, and it keeps us all awake. Like, hold on for a minute. Is she for real? Sabrina's attempt to manipulate the elimination by bringing personal issues to the forefront not only showcased her lack of professionalism, but also highlighted her willingness to betray a teammate by playing dirty in a competition that should have been about culinary skill, not personal vendettas. During the Italian night service, Sabrina's behavior towards Gail was yet another serious letdown. She was in charge of the grill, but struggled big time with timing, leaving Ramsey and her entire team in the dark. Um, chef, my pork. Just give me a f***ing time! Okay, four minutes on Thank my pork, you. chef! Talk to your team now! Yes, chef. Gail attempted to coordinate with Sabrina in spite of it all, but the inconsistent timing threw her off. How long on the second pork, Sabrina? Probably about seven, eight minutes. No, I don't trust Sabrina at all. She doesn't know her timing. Then, in a move that reeked of betrayal, she knowingly sent her dish out. Even though Gail wasn't ready with her pasta, she told her to wait. We're waiting for the pasta now. It just makes Gail look bad. <laughs> and yeah, everybody heard that. Yeah, it was a deliberate move to make Gail look bad. Plain and simple. Everybody thinks that I'm stupid, but you know what? I'm one manipulative girl. Sabrina's actions were downright underhanded. Her confession painted her as someone who prioritized herself over the team as a collective. And honestly, who would want to work with someone like that? Instead of focusing on her own strengths during the elimination plea, she chose the path of least integrity. She was more concerned about pointing out others' weaknesses and throwing even more lame excuses out left and right. When it was her turn to speak up, Sabrina attempted to justify her spot by exaggerating her supposedly good performances, all the while conveniently using her inexperience as a safety net. Who would you rather have work for you? Somebody who has a title of an executive chef or somebody who hasn't been doing it this long? But Ramsey wasn't having any of it. He called her out, absolutely destroying her for using using her inexperience as an excuse. Don't use that inexperience excuse on me ever again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that was never gonna work. And by the way, this was something he made abundantly clear in previous seasons. I don't give two f**ks about how much experience you've got. What I do care about is who has the magic, who has it. Sabrina's pleas throughout the entire season were a disaster. Her over-the-top drama and all-too-common deflection absolutely stunk of immaturity and a lack of accountability. Instead of, you know, showing genuine passion or a willingness to learn from mistakes, she relied on empty experience excuses, and pointed fingers. A hell of an unfortunate duo, if I've ever seen one. Now, let's talk about the time when Zacky pulled the wackiest move on Ray in season 11. You see, right from the prep phase before the 11th service, when Ray offered his help, Zack blatantly ignored him causing frustration among his teammates, including Anthony, who wasn't happy about Zack's sluggishness. Let's go, Zack. Can't be dragging ass. He needs to snap the hell out of it. Yeah, blatant disregard for teamwork and camaraderie. During the private dinner service, Zack's attempt to assist Ray on plating ended disastrously. Ramsey and Ray noticed Zack's sloppy plate with minimal pasta and no lobster. Hey, Zack, look at that, and look at that. There's no lobster in there, Zack. But you should be leaving this then. Tell it! This frustrated Ray, who rightfully questioned Zack's commitment, leading to a heated exchange. Zack, do me a favor. Fuck off, me, please. Take it over here. You're killing me. You're killing me. Try to throw me under the bus. During a refire, Ray requested him to finish cooking the lobster in butter. Zack retaliated by sabotaging it cooking it in a cold sauce instead. Earlier, Chef Ray tells me to f and now I'm definitely gonna get revenge. I'm trying to sabotage him. Yeah, quite openly at that. Hey, come here, just touch that. It's cold! Ray is cold. This sabotage not only angered Ramsey, who obviously rejected the cold lobster, but also incited Ray's fury towards Zack for undermining the entire team. Later, when leading the New York strip course, Zack seemed really disinterested when John was asking about the sauce. Zack, where's your sauce at? Why can't he talk? He's not answering me, he's completely switched off. Ramsey saw that the steaks weren't being seasoned like the red teams from a mile away. 
which sparked a confrontation, with Zack clumsily trying to defend himself and Ramsey accusing him of lying. We seasoned on No, are you lying? You did not slice it and season. <sighs> it's always the seasoning, isn't it? And he really thought he could fool Ramsey. Go ahead and add his name to the list of the hundreds that came before him who've tried and failed. But in short, Zack's betrayal showed a complete lack of respect and teamwork. His actions not only disrupted service, but disrespected the hell out of his teammates, especially Ray. I'm so pissed at Zack. I'm like, dude, you just, you f***ed me. But with all that being said, I really have no idea how this happened. Ray, please give me your jacket. Yeah, sure. Ray often faces rightful criticism for his performance, but his elimination that night in favor of keeping Zack around was utterly absurd. Ramsey caught Zack red-handed, deliberately trying to sabotage Ray, yet Ray got sent home over him? Gotta say, Ramsey, I do not understand the logic here, unless you're looking for a deceitful head chef. Moving on, let's look at what happened during season 16's third service. During prep, she refused to communicate and openly stated that she wasn't in the mood to work, which really got under Aziza, Wendy, and Heather's skin. You notice I just doing a whole lot of nothing? We're watching her the whole time. This lack of commitment and effort set a negative tone right from the start. What you working on? I don't know. I'm not in a mood right now. That's very lacy of her, pun intended. During dinner service, Gia's performance at the meat station was marred by inconsistencies and questionable actions. While her first attempt at the lamb was acceptable, her next one was overcooked. It's like feel, it's overcooked. Hello, an absolute meltdown. Her refire attempts were no better, culminating in Ramsey's shock at her Wellingtons being horrendously sliced. I've never ever in the history of Hell's Kitchen been given a Wellington's, not even, not even sliced. Oh, and he wasn't done. It's like some bad from the woods, the most expensive cut anywhere in the world. And look at the way it's dumped. Who gave me this? What followed was a feeble attempt to excuse her blunder by claiming she nearly cut her finger off, prompting Ramsey to call for medical assistance. Sorry, I cut my finger off, Chef. You cut your finger off? Yes. Show me. Should I get the medic? Medic! However, Ramsey's attempt to verify her injury exposed Gia's ruse. Despite her claims of a near finger amputation, there was no visible cut or any blood on her finger at all. Where's the cut? Where's the cut? Right here. Where? It's not there. So she wanted an easy way out. The red team lost the service, and during deliberations, this happened. But who's volunteering themselves to go up tonight? I'll do it. I'll do it. I Eventually, Jen volunteered, and Gia was nominated. I'm not an arguer. I hate arguing. I lived with that in my family, and I just don't like it. But Jessica's plea for staying in Hell's Kitchen really shed light on her personal struggles. She admitted to nominating herself out of a deep-rooted fear of arguments, a trauma rooted in her past experiences of growing up in a household filled with constant conflict. This revelation hinted at a potential battle with PTSD, resulting from her dysfunctional family environment. It seems that her coping mechanism involved avoiding disputes, making her self-nomination a means to dodge future potential conflicts within the team. On the flip side, here's what Gia said. Anytime I'm in the kitchen, I'm working hard, always ready to help one of my teammates. I don't never come in here with an attitude. Hey, you know you were being recorded. Right? We saw you stand and give up on your team during prep because, oh, not in the mood. But wait, she had more to add. She's already packed. I'm not packed. I'm ready to stay here. This move to spill dorm secrets to Ramsey didn't earn her any popularity points. She was seen as a rat for not upholding team solidarity. Jessica, you've packed. You are not ready. To head to Vegas. Despite Ramsey's earlier stance on dorm issues, meaning he clearly said that he didn't care about what goes on in the dorms, his choice to axe Jessica over Gia's betrayal seemed unjust and went against his own stated policy. I guess what I'm trying to say is that these events brought Ramsey's fairness into question. Jessica's struggles and her coping mechanism should have been considered more empathetically. 
especially since her performance wasn't notably worse than Gia's. I genuinely couldn't grasp what Ramsey saw in Gia. To me, it seemed like one of the most straightforward decisions on the show to eliminate her. However, instead of Gia leaving, Jessica went home instead. Sure, Jessica's mistake in packing was bad, but she only messed up one plate throughout that whole service. Her other services showed improvement, either performing well or bouncing back after a slip-up. On the other hand, Gia lied about her finger injury and completely messed up the meat. I mean, come on, it's night and day. But I'm curious what your take on all of this is. Meanwhile, let me hop over to the next topic. Now, in Season 9, following a challenging service, Ramsey tasked the final five chefs with a crucial decision, nominating two individuals for elimination. Elise orchestrated a calculated move. She individually approached both Will and Paul, artfully persuading them to consider Jennifer as the weakest link among the remaining chefs. I am asking you for a favor. When I go up there, I'm going to put Jennifer as the weakest because she is. Typical high school shit. Just say that in front of everyone. Why the backhandedness? She was only looking out for herself by pitting the others against Jennifer like that. I'm being diplomatic and I'm asking you to look out for me because I will look out for you. I know you're better than me. God, how low was she willing to go? But Jennifer was wise to Elise's sly tactics. Confident in her own abilities and considering herself superior to Elise in various aspects, she hoped that Paul and Will would see through Elise's manipulation. After all the she's put us through, Will and Paul are smart enough not to fall for Elise's One can only hope. The deliberation turned into a tense chess game as Ramsey probed the chefs for their nominations. Who is the weakest chef? Come on, man, it's an easy answer. But Paul struggled to make a definitive choice first, prompting Will to abruptly lend his support to Elise as the stronger chef, much to Jennifer's and frankly my disbelief. Solely based on cooking, chef? Uh, Pure I, cooking! I think Elise is a stronger cook than Jennifer is. It was tough to watch. Eventually, Paul sided with Elise as being the stronger cook, too. Who's the worst cook? Jennifer Chef. You Thank you! Kidding me. I'm just, I'm being honest! At least Tommy didn't give in to the pressure and did the right thing by saying that Elise was the weakest link. This sequence of events culminated in the heartbreaking elimination of Jennifer. Despite her undeniable talent and consistent performance throughout the competition, the strategic manipulation orchestrated by Elise and the wavering decisions of her fellow contestants led to Jennifer's unjust departure. I can't believe you two would actually sit here and say that she is better than me. I am. And fans weren't happy. Everyone agreed that Jennifer should have stayed instead. And I mean, hear, here. Will and Paul were manipulated to backstab Jennifer, but it's not like they didn't have any personal motive in this. Jennifer was obviously the better chef and therefore the biggest threat. At least Tommy had integrity and wanted to have an equal fight in the end. What do you think? Be sure to drop your thoughts in the comments below. I'm genuinely curious. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you thought this video was crazy, make sure to check out the next one right here. It's even better.